Brilliant. Um, so thanks for showing up this afternoon. That's always a good place to start. And I like to start presentations on a high. So I'm going to talk about logistics. So if you want to follow along today, um, there's this workshop.bioconductor.org link, which will take you to a cloud instance and you can click on the spatial, spatial little thing that will open up an R studio and you can follow along if you want to. Um, we're going to be quite rushed. So don't follow along if you don't want to, because it's probably a waste of your time. Um, so in saying that, because I'm advocating that maybe you don't want to follow along, I am advocating that you ask me lots of questions because I'm happy for questions. I've got a pre-compiled version of what we're doing. So if I get frustrated with things running, we can flip over and just skim through that in five minutes and knock things over right away. Um, if, for those of you that have been in the last few sessions, I struggle to speak sometimes. Um, so if I'm stuttering on a word, feel free to play guess the word and just shout it out for me so that we can uh, move on uh, with the content. Um, and there's also a GitHub link to where this, the code for the workshop is as well. All right, so we're going to be talking about Stacial. Um, so Stacial is a very intelligent play on the words state and spatial. And so we're going to be looking at the, how cell states can kind of change in, in different spatial contexts. And so um, everything I'm presenting today isn't really my own work. It's the work of many others, um, in particular uh, Farhan, Nick and uh, Alex. They've been putting a ton of work in over the last couple of weeks to get this up and going. Uh, so I'd like to just acknowledge them and the hard work they did and then offload any uh, detailed questions to them. So uh, we, we've heard two or three or this morning another four sessions on spatial technologies okay. so i'm not going to go into technologies themselves but i do want to highlight that everything i'm talking today is analysis done at cell resolution um, so the idea would be if you can take any of these technologies and end up with a cell x y coordinates and maybe some expression values then you're good to go um, so we're not talking about big spot-based technologies, which maybe you could deconvolute and get down to cells, or subcellular analysis of RNA molecules, or taking things back to a cell. And so uh, I do like to start with, with uh, this plot. So this is a, a, a core of head and neck cancer measured with uh, imaging mass cytometry. Uh, and there was around 38 or 40 um, proteins in, in the panel that they measured. And here I've highlighted six of them. And what you can see is that with just six proteins, you're able to see a lot of complexity in a tissue. I think this is really, really important to acknowledge when we're doing any spatial analysis, to acknowledge that spatial stuff is complex. And if we don't model or think about that complexity, and we really can't interpret any quantifications that we end up making. And so when in doubt, assume that your quantification is simple and that it's probably not really, um, it can be confounded at least by cool, complex stuff that's going on. Um, but this is really what motivates most of my research. So how do we start to get meaningful quantifications out of things that are clearly very complex? And so we've been spending a fair bit of time over the last few years trying to develop um, R packages that help us start to, to wrangle and get our heads around um, uh, spatial data. And so today uh, we're going to be tangentially uh, touching on uh, three of our packages. So SPICE R is something we use to do co-localization analysis. Lisa Cluster is something we use to find tissue microenvironments. And Classify R is a package that we use to evaluate um, the performance of machine learning algorithms. Um, just because this is a bioconductor conference, uh, we've also just made this molecule experiment package as a kind of data infrastructure for the mole molecule resolved spatial technologies. This is something I'd like to talk about uh, if anyone's got time in the next couple of days. Okay, and so today uh, we're focusing on spatial. And so, like I said, I'd really like you to ask a lot of questions uh, throughout this session and probably not so much focus on my code, 
uh, but hopefully, again, focus on big picture and really try to understand some things. So I'm going to try to like smash some opinions at you every now and then. And so this is one of those opinion moments where hopefully you might learn something. So when we first started doing spatial analysis in our group, we kind of came at the problem of thinking about if we've got two different cell types, can we find if they're dispersed or avoiding each other, or can we find if they're localized or attracted <coughs> towards each other? And to us, that was the, the key goal of our spatial analysis. That's obviously simple because we're just looking at pairwise combinations of cells, but it's also simple because we're ignoring the behavior of, of all other cells. Uh, it's also simple because uh, the way that we were designing our experiments potentially really influenced how quantifications of these two phenomena might be. So it's an example of a problem. Um, here we've got an image uh, with red cells and blue cells, and I would argue maybe that these two things are, uh, are just randomly distributed throughout a tissue. Um, there's really not that much of any evidence that there's a strong relationship between red and blue. If I was to zoom out a little bit, I'd actually start to make a conclusion that maybe these two things are avoiding each other. One's at the bottom part of the image, one's at the top part of the image. But to do some sort of quantification, it would say, hey, these two things are avoiding each other. If I zoom out a little bit further, now I'm in a situation where if I was to quantify things in the scale of this image, now the two things are attracted. They're both co-localizing down in the bottom left hand corner of the image. And so I would just like to stress to you that when you're doing any sort of uh, spatial uh, quantification, the perspective that you take on your images is really, really important. And so that really frames the whole purpose of uh, today's talk, which is that maybe we can use the concept of a cell state to help us start to navigate some of these tissue complexities. And so I want to avoid the what is a cell type, what is a cell state conversation that bogs down every single conference or workshop that I go to. Um, just acknowledge the fact that when I say cell state, I really just care more about an analytical framework where we're looking at subsets of cells as opposed to some big board. Okay, anyone have any questions while I'm flipping over? No, that's great. So now we're going to move to the live coding that is definitely working. There we go, I can do this. This is 100% gonna work. So I'd like to highlight a few things, which- Can we hide the little button? Can we hide what? Show your- Oh, your oh yeah, right. that, was the, that was the message on um, the email. Yeah, now none of you can hack me. <laughs> so I would like to acknowledge the fact that this this desk isn't exactly um, OHS standard, and so I'm going to really struggle to type uh, unless I get like a water seat or something. So live coding is going to be painful for me. So as I'm typing really slowly, just um, acknowledge the fact that things are hard. Okay, so. I said uh, that I don't really want to get dogged down into what cell type and cell state are, um, but I would like to at least acknowledge that there's two ways that I analytically think about what a cell state is. And one, I think about cell states as being subclusters of some broader cluster. So you have T cells as a cell type, and then CD4 positive T cells and CD8 positive T cells as a particular cell state of a cell type. Obviously, you could think of CD4 positive cells as the cell type, and then some cluster, subcluster below that, and that's cool. But when I say uh, cell state, sometimes I just mean subclusters. Another type of cell state would be if you have a cluster of cells, the cell state would be if a marker, any particular marker is changing within that cell type. So maybe in a T cell, you see CD4 increasing in expression. Maybe there's been a change in cell state. Everything I'm doing here is in markers. There's really no nothing stopping you from using some morphological features as well, just cell shell cell size and cell shape could be possible things that uh, you could use. Okay, so that's that's how I think about cell states from an analytical perspective. 
Uh, to, to demonstrate uh, spatial, we're going to be using uh, this MIBITOF data set um, from 2018 uh, from Leah Karen. Uh, and it measures 36 proteins uh, on, uh, we're going to filter it down to 34 uh, immune rich uh, patients. And so this is MIBITOF, so it's not a huge image, so it's, it's easier for us to kind of get our heads around them. So I've loaded in the data already. I'm going to filter it and let's see what it looks like. So this loads up a, a spatial experiment. You can see it's a spatial experiment because it says spatial experiment. Um, <coughs> pro tip, um, spatial experiments have got this, this brilliant spatial coordinates slot. Uh, for saving your X and Y coordinates. Whenever I get a spatial experiment, I also like to put spatial coords into the reduced dim names. So when you're using a lot of the, the visualization packages on uh, a bioconductor, particularly SCADA, um, a lot of them are kind of geared up to use that. So that makes life easier. Right, so let's learn a little bit about our data. So I generated a UMAP before with SCADA. I saved it to save us around five minutes of time. Uh, and this is what we see. Um, and so UMAP plots are UMAP plots. Sometimes you see structure. Most of the time you see structure. Who knows if it's meaningful or not. Um, and we see clearly lots of blobs, but they roughly segregate uh, from these cell types, where these cell types were kind of manually curated in a very weird way. Um, if we wanted to, we could plot by lots of different things. So instead of plotting um, a UMAP, filter it down to one image so that this thing makes sense. I would love it if someone made a little convenience function to filter single cell or spatial experiments. Make life easy. Oh, let me see. There we go. Let's look at an image. Here we've got an image. We can see that a big portion of this image is taken up by keratin tumor cells and then mixes of lots of other things. Um, so we've got ourselves a spatial experiment. We've got ourselves X, Y locations. We've got ourselves cell types. And then we've also got um, row names. We've got a bunch of different uh, markers and proteins that are measured. So we're going to start by analyzing cell states in that discrete way I was talking about. So effectively subclusters of a broader cluster. And so you might remember this kind of visualization. So what we're going to be doing is here we've got a cell type A, which has two states, pink and red. And we've also got cell type B in blue. And we're going to be looking uh, for relationships uh, between a cell state, so state two, with cell type B in the context of the rest of cell type A. And so naturally, if you were to start making some conclusions from this plot, your eyes and your brain tell you that cell type A is closer to cell type B than, so state Two is closer to cell type B than state one. I don't have to twist your arms uh, to tell you that. But this is obviously a really extreme and obvious example. So we've developed a framework that kind of makes it easy to ask this when you've got more subtle relationships. And so that methodology is something we call contextual. And so what contextual does is whether you form a hierarchy from a data generating way, or you have a predefined one, we effectively have these cell type hierarchies. So you've got different child populations, and then you've got broader cell type populations. And arguably, those broader cell type populations have got even broader cell populations. So cell states are kind of all relative. We then calculate densities of where we expect any sort of parent or the, the broad cell type to be calculate distances, smoosh it all together, and then get quantifications of spatial relationships. And so let's walk through what's going on. So we're going to start by defining 
hierarchies of cells. And so here I've said that keratin tumor and whatever not, is not keratin tumor are all broadly part of some tumor population. By T cells, I've just put anything that has T cell in the name into a broad population. And so on. Um, so Karen et al. had this really nice example in the first sphere of their manuscript that really demonstrates the type of phenomenon that we're going to be looking at. And so I'm going to just get, all I'm going to do here is just to find that relationship. So they manually gated out uh, some P, P53 positive uh, tumor cells. So this chunk of code is just pulling out P53 tumor cells. Don't break, could not find assay. Could not find assay because no one told me to load on my library. <laughs> Uh, we also set theme equals classic because you're the devil if you don't. <laughs> where, where, where? Equals minimal. Oh no, we jammed back up. Okay, motivating example. So what we've got here, the dark grey are immune cells, the light grey are tumour cells, and the green are P53 positive tumor cells. And so I don't know about you, but when I squint at this picture, my brain wants to tell me that P53 tumor cells are closer to immune cells than P53 negative cells. Hopefully I don't have to twist your arms to make that. Uh, we'll get there though, to show that if you were just to calculate a, a typical um, spatial quantification, you'd actually end up finding that they're actually quite dispersed. And I shouldn't have to twist your arm about that either. So if you imagine that immune cells were water and tumor cells were oil, I wouldn't have to tell you that these two things aren't mixing at all. They're completely separated. So they're dispersed, right? The P53 positive tumor cells are closer to immune cells than tumor cells. So I hope you're starting to appreciate that slight subtlety in the types of the way that you ask a question or the way that your brain views a question is actually really important for what you end up finding. All right, so we developed this method called contextual. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. You just need to tell it a, a radii that you want to look at around cells. I can go into methodology if you want later types of cells you want to look at and whatever parent population you're wanting to do this uh, analysis. What's image equals six there? Image equals six. I'm going to do this for one particular image, which okay. is just this image. And so this is going to work perfectly. Okay, what does this tell us? So this isn't incredibly well labeled, but original here is an uh, L function, which is a really traditional way of summarizing spatial co-localization. Uh, and the way that you would interpret this uh, centered L function is that because it is negative, it tells you the two <coughs> cell types was dispersed, which oil and water, they clearly were. If you use this contextual method, though, you find this is now positive. Although, so these two things are kind of attracted to each other. Hopefully you can appreciate though that the scale of these things is actually supposed to be quite similar. So they were highly dispersed, but then now they're just mildly spatially co-localized. Uh, but like I said, these are really traditional statistics that people use. And so when people like to look at L functions and K functions, they don't just like to look at point estimates normally. Normally they like to look at things um, over a curve. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to calculate these contextual values uh, over a range of radii so that we can generate this kind of And so on the x-axis, we've got a radii around the cell. On the y-axis, we've got our centered functions. And you can see if we were kind of to narrow in at radii equals 50, we end up in this scenario where the, case, the our new contextual value is just above zero the others was highly dispersed but then as the radii gets bigger and bigger the things start to look like they're actually co-localizing so there's a big value in when you're doing spatial analysis to think broadly about the types of things you want to find are you looking for relationships that have it happen at a really really localized kind of spatial 
uh, region, or are you looking for broader, um, big contextual? Um, shouldn't use the word contextual. Bigger, um, uh, bigger radii, bigger resolution. Okay, so that's just one particular image and one particular cell type relationship. We've obviously got a function that can go through all pairwise combinations in a tree-wise structure uh, to calculate all these relationships. This takes around 20 minutes on a single core. And so we're not going to do that right now. We're going to load in a predefined uh, version. And what we end up finding goes back and back, is that there's lots of different cell type combinations where things change from being dispersed to localized or kind of localized and then very localized. Um, so you could skim through all of those if you want, um, but the relationships are there, that's what they are. Okay, so that's all well and good. I've told you that you should uh, perform spatial analysis in lots of different ways to get different outcomes. I predominantly work in the cancer data sets, and so all any person that comes to me cares about is are these things predictive or informative for understanding a patient outcome. And so it's obviously quite easy. Once we kind of run contextual, we can end up in a space where we end up in a nice matrix. So here I'm just going to define a survival outcome. Let's look at what that is. Everyone's done survival analysis in R. Um, this is your survival outcome. Uh, we've got this prep matrix function, which takes our results output and puts it into a beautiful square matrix that every statistician loves. And then once we've got a nice square matrix, we can just go do some tests. And spicy R, we've got a little convenience function just to do tests on columns. So T test, Wilcox, and rank some tests and survival analysis. There's obviously plenty of other ways to do that. And so I don't in any way advocate this. But if we go do tests on every single column of these, we find out that there are some pairwise relationships that seem to be uh, potentially um, uh, incriminated in being um, related to survival. So here we've got mesenchymal cells being localized with macrophages in the context of just the broader tissue population. So in terms of all cells, then we've got some other cool relationships as well. So because everyone likes looking at Kaplan-Meier curves, if we take that first relationship and split it on the median, we can see that um, good survivors and poor survivors are, are separated uh, by dispersion or localization of these two cell types in the context of all the tissue. So what this tells us is that cell state relationship can be informative for understanding things about patients. And we know that, especially in cancer, people always talk about immune uh, infiltration and how this stuff is going to survival or drug response. So it's not surprising. So that is one way of conceptualizing cell states. Subclusters, we've developed a little method to, to do some of this kind of subcluster analysis. There are other ways that you can do it, and I'm happy to talk about other ways that I'd like to do it with you uh, at any of our lunch times. The next way to think about things is in terms of continuous changes in cell state. So I talked about if you just have a cell type, is a marker changing? So here we have this nice little toy example where as our circle cells get closer to the square cells, some sort of marker increases in expression. Analytically, this is potentially a really thing, easy thing to analyze. You could maybe just take a, like, calculate the, the, the nearest distance, the smallest distance between a circle cell and a red cell, and then plot the marker expression and they either fit like a linear regression or a GAM or something else and look for a relation. This doesn't look too complicated. You could obviously use like the, the five nearest, five, five nearest neighbors, or you could look at an abundance sort of circle round cells. But effectively, in my head, you always end up in this type of situation. Where you've got this really simple, is the marker expression in cell type A in any way correlated with its distance or its spatial relationship with cell type. 
So uh, in our package, we've got this, this function called get distances, which just goes and calculates uh, the, the closest distance between one cell type and another and stores it as a reduced dimension uh, in uh, our spatial experiment. Also got get abundances, which calculates radii around cells uh, and the, the number of cell types in a certain radius, and again, stores that in your spatial experiment. And so if we were to go back to our nice little toy example, we saw that P53 in tumour cells should probably increase as tumour cells are closer to immune cells. So here, I'm too lazy to code in immune cells, so I'm going to look, um, looking at keratin-positive tumour cells, as they get close to macrophages, what does P53 do? Again, this is effectively just fitting a, a regression. And what we end up finding is that there's a super, super, super strong relationship between P53 expression and the spatial locations between uh, these tumor and cells and effectively immune cells. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can you go back a bit to the, the distance? Is that, yeah. That seemed very efficient, but it ran pretty fast. Yeah, so this is just using the close pairs um, function in SpatStat, and it is pretty fast. Originally, I tried to do my own thing with data table, and it wasn't as fast. And so now I don't do that. <laughs> um, you have an idea like how many points you can handle? So this is actually the problem with SpatStat that I haven't explored. So my images aren't very big. Now I'm seeing images that are like one, one millimeter squared. There were situations where I tried to do certain analysis. That stat yelled at me when it got to 60,000 cells, which didn't seem like a lot. Um, so I haven't run into that problem again since whatever I did five years ago. But I have to imagine that it is going to be a problem at some point. And maybe that stat's functionality is not going to be the place to it. So I don't know if Terra has got other things um, or SF, but. I imagine things do scale, it's just maybe this isn't the place to scale. Yeah, it's pretty fast. And I take no credit. Um, okay, so let's plot these things. What do we see? So if we go look at our plot, uh, this plot, we've got all the kind of uh, blue dots, are our uh, macrophages, so kind of our immune population. And then we've got their density kind of shaded in blue. And we can see that the tumor cells have more red when they're closer to the blue. Fantastic. What does this look like in terms of our wonderful toy scatter plot that we were hoping to see? It looks awful. And that's okay. Um, we've looked at lots of different ways of modeling this. There's obviously all this kind of zero stuff. We've thought about um, zero inflated models. We thought about potentially doing weird cutoffs and doing all of these weird kind of tests. They all end up telling you the same thing when you've got a p value of minus 10 to minus 12. Yep. Well, yeah, that's very significant because you knew what genes to look at. What if you don't know what genes to look at? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, let's run the whole thing. <laughs> so we're going to run the whole thing across um, all pairwise combinations of cell types uh, and then all markers. And so there are multiple points in time. So I think there's three points in time where a code, piece of code I run takes either a minute or two minutes. And that wasn't one of them. So here we've got uh, some of the relationships. We've got these current tumor and unidentified uh, cells somehow doing something with this NA marker, which I actually think is just a, a, a metal ion that didn't measure anything. So that's not great to see. Uh, but we can at least go look at this keratin tumor macrophages and the HLA class one. And we get nicer, slightly nicer looking plots. So here is something where you'd argue there is a linear relationship. So this definitely is an a notch relationship where two things are touching. There seems to be some weird distance thing. What, what's, what's the x-axis and the y-axis here? x-axis is the distance between tumor cells and macrophages. This should be labeled better. Thank you. Um, and then the y-axis is the expression of HLA class 1 in tumor cells. So it's minus 5? Yep. 
I don't know if it's been normalized or standardized. It has quite a tumor cell here. Each point is a tumor cell, yes. Uh -huh. And does it make sense to think that each tumor cell is independent in this regression? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. You'd have to think about it, right? Like tumors obviously kind of grow and all those kinds of things. You have to imagine the tumors next to each other are probably playing off each other, like they're sending out signals along the line. And so arguably you're right, they're probably not completely independent. So interpretation of this is that there's slightly higher yeah. HLA class one in tumor cells closer to macrophages than tumor cells more distant from macrophages. Thank you for saying that in a better way that I could. Is that what it's supposed to be? That is exactly what it's supposed to be. And then obviously we could look at these types of plots as well. Okay, so that was just the, the image uh, six images. We can obviously look broader at um, other relationships. And so can anybody look at maybe uh, some of these relationships and tell me what's, what's worrying? <clears throat> look at the third one. <clears throat> <laughs> so I know very, very little biology, uh, but CD20 is a marker for B cells. And so this third line tells you that as, C as CD4 T cells get closer to B cells, the abundance of CD20 increases. So if you have a T cell getting close to a B cell and a B cell marker that should only be expressed in B cells is increasing. It's not real, it doesn't take like a lot of thought to think about what is probably happening. And it becomes really, really obvious uh, if you look at a plot. So let's go look at our plots again. So now we end up with this wonderful plot. Each single dot is a T cell. We've got its distance to a B cell and the expression of CD20. And we can see that if you have a distance that's less than 30 microns, you start getting these really, really, really big expressions of CD20. And so this is my next, before you ask a question, this is my next big learning moment for this that I want you to take away, which is no matter what cell type segmentation you run currently, you always end up with these issues of lateral spillover of markers. So you always end up with, you try to segment a cell if you've got another cell type that near it, you pick up that marker expression. We've used lots and lots of different segmentations and lots and lots of different technologies, and it keeps happening over and over and over again. And it is the fundamental limitation of doing this type of cell state analysis because the vast majority of relationships you find are all driven by lateral spillover. And so you can obviously do like maybe fancy things where maybe you try to do cutoffs and throw away certain things, but we have tried everything under the sun and we can't fix the problem. And so my answer to this problem, I wanted to be able to take segment, segmented data where I just have an X and a Y and markers and go and do my fancy statistics. I think if you want to do this type of analysis, you have to be going back to the images, the pixel level and doing something fancy there that is completely out of my realm of capabilities so i'd love to see someone doing that i know that there's people already out there doing cell type clustering i know that there are people out there that have been trying to correct this level of spillover and we haven't tried that method yet but it's it's the fundamental problem with this type of analysis sorry i'm just trying to understand the x-axis again so the x-axis we need to label this different this is so each dot is a t-cell and this is the distance of that T cell to a B, to its closest T cell. To one closest T cell, yeah. not out. Very closest. And this is on a different scale than the previous because the maximum here is 200. I think the maximum on the other one was 200 as well, but maybe there weren't anything over that 200. Yeah, I stopped everything at 200. Okay. And that's because close pairs get slow the bigger and bigger and bigger distance you want to. Use. So it's not great for calculating minimum distances because you end up calculating lots of distances. And so I don't know how to run close pairs and say stop. I just want the first one. And and so each of these is an x y coordinate. Um, yeah, and as so, you're going to get closer, you're going to kind of get overlap on this. And is there like the polygon around the cell? Yeah. 
So each of these, I'm just analyzing things in a spatial experiment where I've got an X and Y coordinate. I'm assuming that someone's taken a polygon and just calculated the average abundance of a marker in that polygon and then found Put a centroid, it. centroid. And then I'm coming along and doing my spatial statistics. Well, happy so, and thinking everything's fine. So, so where you've got these two, you're ignoring the polygon information. Yep. So you Which could is. well be actually into an Excel if, if it's depending on how that those yep. polygons look. The problem is those polygons aren't perfect either. And so we find out with any technology we play with, the segmentations that are just aren't there yet. Um, so yep. how many Z planes do you have? Like, uh, are you like using one polygon for the entire like all the all those Z planes? Because like cells are not cylinders, but if you pretend they are, you will inevitably get into like neighboring cells. So the majority of analysis I do is with IMC data. And IMC data it's an ablation technology, and you're in oh. one Z plane. Um, but that could be causing a problem, right? Yeah, of course, because the tissue is slightly thick. Yeah. And so there, there's lots of reasons why this lateral spill might happen. One is because you've got multiple Z planes and things are legitimately overlapping. The other is that your cell segmentation is garbage and you've just missed the cell. And so we've got a method for calculating. Uh, so we tried lots and lots and lots of things. This will take a minute to run. We tried lots and lots and lots of things. And the thing that we tried the most was just cell type deconvolution. We thought if this, if we just thought about this, this, this faulty segmentation is just nearly what we end up with, like at the Visium kind of level, like you've just got mixtures of cell types in there. We'd be able to come along, deconvolute it and include whatever deconvolution scores we have in our modeling. No matter how we decided to include those, those, how we decided to deconvolve, how we decided to include that in the modeling, none of it worked um, well. It works a little. And so, in another minute, we're going to find out how well it may be worked. How was cell type annotation performed up until this? Day? So, I am going to make things up. So the majority of the data sets that came out at this period of time, they over clustered their data. So they would come up with a hundred clusters and then they would manually go through and merge those down to 20. So if I was to take a punt on how the cell types were clustered, that would be my punt. Yep. Is it possible to test, mask out the closest cells? So you showed for the B cells and T cells. Okay, so we, okay. we tried this deconvolution in any way we could. We kind of tried spatially naive, where you just have like a reference and you try to deconvolute the cell. We tried, well, let's only look at the closest cell or the three closest cells and deconvolute those. I, I didn't mean for the deconvolution, I meant actually for the like for the modeling. And then, yes. we tried that as well. Doesn't help. Not too much. Okay. It's just and when you start because this is this is low parameter data so this is only 38 proteins and so you don't have much to go with when you're modeling and things are variable and it just, just doesn't work we tr well, at least my honest student tried and tried and tried and he couldn't get it working and i believe him i think i trust him why have we got to go 28 seconds did you try to simply shrink the polygons so cell because like there is actually like, decontamination yeah, props so, by this. So we haven't shrunk it past the nucleus. So even when you just segment the nucleus, you still end up with these issues. At least the only place I've done that is with the cosmic stuff. So I don't know, I haven't tried other technologies yet, but in cosmics we still saw it when we just so when we it. did that, we also saw also saw a massive difference in cell typing. Yeah. Like cells originally were B cells and all of a sudden they were Cells, that's yeah. which is also kind of interesting, right? Because that's also important for your model as well. Yeah, especially things like cosmics <laughs> where things are quite sparse. I could right. see that happening really easily. I'm not really much sure with the proteomic stuff if like the cell type signals are strong enough that they might be able to blast through. It, is it like, you know, if you think this is antibody based or is it mass tag based? Mass tag based. Okay. And do you, is, is the mass tag that Actually, like, yeah. and Two bodies in the tube, yeah. You just use sodium and you do the yeah. metals there as mass tag. Um, but do you get sort of like non specific 
binding. See, in, in antibody, you get non-specific binding, yep. and you can nearly model each individual antibody because some antibodies are have a higher background than others. So taking that individual so the answer antibody, is yes, um, but hopefully, like obviously, in specific binding can be spatially related. But when you look at images, you see it, especially for poorly optimized um antibodies and you often see them binding to very specific cell types they shouldn't be yeah. like plasma cells just like suck up everything um but in the case of like t cells and b cells hopefully you're not too worried and it should be specific, like it should, hopefully should happen across the whole image it is a problem and i'd love to talk about normalization so the, the summary for normalization, when in doubt with the Nomics technology, remove the first principal component and move on. That seems to work okay, but I think there's lots of work to be done in how do you normalize this type of data to account for the specific binding. And I talked about lateral mark or spillover, you've also got channel mark or spillover in some of these technologies, whether it's the, the masses or the fluorophores in the issue. So I agree it's probably an artifact, but when you said you went back to the nucleus, is it just CD20 that these T cells are expressing or is there like mixtures of other things? They express, they express lots of other things. It's just CD20 comes across as the strongest thing when T cells get close to B cells. So you probably have the metric when you were trying all your methods that didn't quite work. Uh, how much of play did the cells being close to each other beyond all the reasons explained um, impact for Things you wait for to go for C20, for example, obviously it's not in the T cells, but the C4 helpers will activate B cells, which will create more C20. So, so you can't just remove this is a random background this because is they the, actually is going up. This is the fundamental, really cool thing. So I've said that I can't do it. I've said that it doesn't work. It's really frustrating me that these things don't make sense. The beautiful thing is that they do make sense. When B cells are near T cells, it's like I see CD20 going up. Great. That means that B cells are near T cells. Like it, there is there is signal and biology there. It's just not the thing that you want to find. And the great thing is we found that when we do this type of analysis, and maybe we'll get there eventually, probably five minutes, maybe not, that if you use these things to try to predict someone's survival or drug response, sometimes this continuous state marker analysis is actually really good at predicting survival because it is capturing these spatial relationships, just not in the way that you want to, maybe. Um, so here's a great plot, effectively an ROC curve. If I kind of just look at like cell type markers and think that a cell type marker is something that I don't want to find in my cell state analysis, then you can see that if I correct my data with cell type deconvolution, I get a slightly better, uh, slightly better capture of cell state markers versus cell type marker relationships. This is clearly a very, very exciting difference. Um, if you zoom in even further, to like the first few things, it kind of gets a tiny bit more exciting. So for the first like 100 false positives, you get a thousand true positives, which is kind of nice and good. So maybe there is value in correcting, uh, but it's not enough for me to be jumping up and down and happy about. So we'll do some quick, um, these things are predictive of survival. Uh, we can look at the survival curves again. What's the next thing that needs to run? Okay, I'm just going to skim over these last things. Because why not? So, last and final method that we've been using to conceptualize things is to think about things in terms of tumor microenvironments instead. So, we've got this nice little package called Lisa Clust, which effectively goes through and tries to find the regions of a tissue that have different compositions of cells. And one type of analysis you might be able to do is simply ask, well, is the abundance of a marker in these red cells different when those red cells are in one region than if those red cells are in another region? Or is the marker expression in those regions different between people as well? So at least the cluster helps us find these kinds of relationships. Here's a plot where we've got all of the different cell types colored, all the hatchings are uh, five different regions that we decided to find. My big plug, it took me two weeks to code up 
hatchings on these plots because I really, really wanted to see spatial regions and cell types in the same space and not kind of next to each other. I am an awful computer scientist. If someone can make hatchings really, really quick and really, really fast, I'd find it really useful and I'd like to use it. So at the moment, this plot takes like a minute or two to run. Uh, so we can calculate uh, the average marker expression in a cell type in a region and use that for patient classification along with cell type proportions and the proportion of each region. Uh, and then we can use classify R, uh, which has this cross validate function. So what will you do with cross validate? We give it a big long list of a lot of different feature sets. Our outcome variable, I say, I'm really dumb today. I just want to do a cross proportional hazards model. Uh, because some of these things have got lots and lots and lots of features, I'm also going to use a cox proportional model to just choose the top 10 features from each data set and then do some five-fold cross-validation with 20 repeats. Uh, when I do that, I get this plot. And so this is the C index. For those of you that don't know what a C index is, think about it like an accuracy or uh, AUC. It's just the performance or the concordance of your predictions with the survival uh, outcome. And anything above 0 0.5 means there's potentially signal there. And what we end up finding in this particular data set, if you just use the proportion of the least classic regions, it's probably the most reliable thing to use as a biomarker to predict survival. Um, but then our contextual relationships seem to be capturing some signal. So there is value in looking at uh, spatial changes in cell state related spatial things. These average expression of a region in a cell type, average expression of a marker in a cell type in a region is potentially something there. Um, and then just naively calculating the regression of the marker versus cell type distance in this data set doesn't give anything. And so when we run these types of things on lots of different data sets, it's like a music, musician's like mixer board. Just every time you run a different data set, a different feature set is often quite useful. And so this is Ellis's next or final thing is there is lots of value in just calculating lots of different quantifications, depending on the data type, depending on the question, depending on the structure of your tissue, uh, different things might, different quantifications might find different relationships and they could be useful for it. So that was me blasting through everything. I'm two minutes over. Um, but I am quite happy to take as many questions either right now or once everyone's left the room. Thank <laughs> you.